Hello everybody, once again this is Fred Monko coming to you from our studios in Chicago with another edition of Bowl Talk on Allen TV and as usual I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon and good evening to you depending on where you are around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, why do I keep bringing these things? I keep bringing them because the truth shall set you free. We can't sit down and let the narrative of our country be distorted by people who have no good intentions for our country. There are bigots who are comfortable in where they are sitting. This video is not for them. This video is for Nigerians who want to tell the true story about Nigerians. This story is for, this video is for Nigerians who want to build a country that works for everybody. The only way we're going to build a country that works for everybody is to tell the story of our history correctly. It's not my position to tell you who to believe. It's your position to listen to the stories and then based on what you hear, decide what you think is right and what you think is wrong. Nigeria has been a tragedy in slow motion. Everybody saw it coming. Anybody who observed Nigeria saw it coming. Sadly, our leaders, both political, business, traditional, and civic, have sat back and watched our country slip into a base. Today, Nigerians are facing rising inflation, stagnant wages, and a sluggish economy. 95% of Nigeria's population is living below the poverty level. It's so bad that we are at the stage where the banks are so unreliable that even the money that people have in the banks are now being rationed to the point that in many cases, when people go into the banks, they only have access to 5,000 Naira withdrawal on a daily basis. In some cases, these people have upwards of 50 million Naira in the bank. We are facing a situation where Nigerians may be going in to rob banks, not to rob banks to steal the bank's money that belong to other people, but to rob the bank to have access to their own money, which the bank is now denying them access to because there is no money in circulation. As bad as this is, it doesn't come to many people who observe Nigeria as a surprise. The country has been mismanaged successively by administration after administration, but over the last eight and a half years, the magnitude of the mismanagement has become so blatant that there is no way the country can survive at the pace it's going. The only thing citizens can get is empty promise after empty promise after empty promise. But there is a history to this. This goes back to the foundation of the country in 1960. The country was founded on very shaky grounds. And I'm going to show you a video that may be the last real high point of a country founded on shaky grounds. It's a video of the visit of Nigeria's Prime Minister, Tafa Balewa, to the United States months after he became President of Nigeria. The promise was very good. The world was looking up to Nigeria to become the leader of Africa. The world continues to wait for Nigeria to become the leader of Africa. The world is going to be waiting for a long time because Nigeria is not ready to lead Africa. After Tafar Balewa's visit to the United States that seemed so promising, 
everything has gone downhill since. Watch carefully immediately after the Tafar Balewa visit to the U.S. and see why Nigeria is where it is today. Prime Minister Balewa is making an official visit to America at the invitation of the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. Waiting at the airport to greet him are Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Mr. Joseph Palmer, the American Ambassador to Nigeria, and other high-ranking American officials. Accompanying the Prime Minister is Minister of Foreign Affairs Wachuku, Ambassador Udochi, and Minister Shagare and Benson, and other key members of the Nigerian government. Mr. Prime Minister, I am honored to welcome you and the distinguished members of your party to the United States. This welcome is only the beginning. You will find as you travel through this country a very deep and genuine interest in the exciting developments which are taking place in your country and in Africa today. I am very pleased to be with you in, the, in Washington today. And I look forward to the week which we are to spend among you. I have no doubt that the American people will receive us with all the kindness that they all receive strangers. Many friendly Americans are waiting to welcome Sir Abubakar to his home in Washington. During his stay in the American capital, the distinguished visitor will reside at the Blair House, the special residence for guests of the American president. In a joint communique summarizing the outcome of their deliberations, they reaffirm their support for the principle of self-determination for dependent peoples and their unalterable opposition to racial discrimination under any name or in any guise. I regard it as a signal honor and privilege to be invited to address this world-famed gathering not only because the United States of America is one of the leading nations of the world and one of the most powerful and advanced on earth today, but also because I believe that those who have struggled and worked to achieve independence will share with you and the great country which you represent a special meaning of liberty of freedom from outside control and opportunities for the fulfillment of one's national desires and cultural heritage. Beautiful words spoken by Prime Minister Tafar Balewa in the United States. Unfortunately, Nigeria started sliding downhill soon after that visit. The reason Nigeria started sliding downhill and never recovered is that Nigerians and Nigeria's leaders have denied Nigerians, at least some Nigerians, have been denied the very things that Tafa Balewa spoke about at the United States meeting with President Kennedy and Lyndon, Vice President Lyndon Johnson. Those things are liberty, freedom, and the pursuit of one's cultural heritage. The next segment I want to show you, and it's a long set segment, actually much of this episode is based on this, is because I continue to tell Nigerians that our problem is not what we think it is. Yes, it it revolves around tribalism. But Nigerians have grown to be so tribalistic 
because Nigeria's history has been distorted. I want everybody who is watching this today, regardless of what tribe you're from, to pay close attention to the roles that Nzogu, Emeko Juku, Namde Azikiwe, and Aguirunsi played in molding Nigeria. And I want you to compare what you hear live, not from me, but from a third party and not from an Igbo person. Compare what you hear in this documentary to the lies that have been told by Nigeria's leaders, especially the Fulani leaders and the bigots in the South. Compare what you see and hear to the stories that's been told about the role that Igbos played in shaping the Nigeria that has become. And just in case you miss it, I'll summarize what you're going to see. You're going to see that Nzogu planned that coup solely to hand over power to Chief Obafemi Awolowo. Listen carefully and attentively. You're also going to see that Namde Azikiwe formed NCNC with Herbert Macaulay, a Yoruba man he respected very much, just to be able to build a Nigeria where there is a coalition of Nigerians, not tribal politics. You're going to see that Odime Gojuku refused to take instructions from Nzogu after Nzogu took over the command in the north where Ojuku was commanding a section of the army that was loyal to Aguirunsi, which meant was loyal to Tafawa Balewa. And finally, you're going to see Aguirunsi's role in quelling that coup and how Aguirunsi worked with Ejo, uh, Colonel Ejo in the Midwest, to foil the coup in the East and in the Midwest. Okbara was spared because Ejo arrested the coup plotters in the East who had arrested Okbara to kill him but never got to killing him before the coup was spelled, uh, quelled. Let's follow history carefully. I don't say this to make it Igbo is right and everybody else is wrong. I bring these things out to say, folks, mistakes have been made in the past. We either fix those mistakes and build a united country or let people go their separate ways. Igbos have been ready to go their separate ways because of the Fulani's vengeance against Igbos, wrong, wrongful vengeance since 1967. Let's build a Nigeria that works for everybody or let everybody go. 1960, Nigerian independence. When Nigeria achieved independence from British colonial rule on the 1st of October 1960, the prospect appeared promising and the expectations for the future of the new country were high. Buoyed largely by the discovery of commercial quantities of petroleum in the south, the potential for economic growth was great. But by 1970, the stability of the country was greatly damaged by a decade of corruption, economic underdevelopment, regionalism, and military coups, culminating in a two and a half year war that saw the deaths of over two million people. In the early 1920s, some European educated Nigerians began to push for greater control over their governance. At the forefront was this man, Sir Albert Macaulay, a civil engineer turned journalist who organized protests in Lagos and other parts of Nigeria, indicating a strong antagonism towards colonial rule. These events resulted in the Clifford Constitution of 1923, which allowed more Nigerians in a newly formed legislative council. The 1930s saw the emergence of a new generation of anti colonial activists calling for a greater involvement of Nigerians in governance. Led by charismatic visionaries and dominated by the ever-growing class of European-educated Nigerians, these new nationalist movements placed increasing pressures on the colonial government for an end to colonial rule. 
with the highest concentration of Western educated Nigerians at that time, Lagos, the colonial capital, was the nucleus of this movement. Before the 1930s, Macaulay and his Nigerian National Democratic Party had dominated the political spectrum in Lagos. But in the early 30s, this new generation of intellectuals would form an organization that would challenge Macaulay's control. This organization was known as the Lagos Youth Movement, which later became the Nigerian Youth Movement in 1934. It began as a body that demanded quality educations for Nigerians, but in a space of four years, it became the most powerful nationalist movement in the country. By 1938, the Nigerian Youth Movement had spread beyond Lagos to many parts of Nigeria, having a combined membership of over 10,000. In 1945, Nigerian workers struck for 37 days over the increase in the cost of living, shutting down postal, railway, and telegraph services around the country in the process. A new organization, the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, NCNC, was an active participant in the strike. The strike ended when the colonial government met the demands of the workers, but this new organization will become a force in the nationalist struggle for Nigeria unity and self-governance. Its leader, Nandi Azikiwe, was the most influential Nigerian nationalist that emerged in the 30s. His great sense of solidarity took him to the leadership of the Nigerian Youth Movement. But in 1941, Azikiwe would leave the Nigerian Youth Movement over a dispute concerning a legislative election he felt was marred by ethnic rivalry. He left along with a large percentage of members to confound the NCNC with Abad Macaulay. The years between 1945 and 1954 saw the introduction of three new constitutions in Nigeria. The first, known as the Richards Constitution, revamped the Legislative Council and allowed Nigerians as a majority for the first time. Under the constitution, Nigeria became a three region federal state, having houses of assemblies in each region and a central legislature based in Lagos. Although the Richards Constitution intended to promote unity among Nigerians, it ended up intensifying regional identities. The NCNC, which started as a leading nationalist organization based on its pan Nigerian motivations, soon became regionally inclined, becoming the single most influential body among the Igbos in the East. The Nigerian youth movement soon fell under the leadership of a wealthy Yoruba Koko farmer called Chief Obafemi Awolowo. Under Awolowo, the NYM became the Action Group, a Yoruba-dominated organization in the West. Awolowo became the leading proponent of Yoruba nationalism, focusing its energies on gaining Yoruba support in the Western region. In the North, the major cultural organization was the Aousa Fulani-inclined Northern People's Congress, founded in 1943 by three of the few Nortonans who had attained high-standard European education at that time. The NPC sought to promote Norton unity and maintain regional autonomy. However, under the leadership of one man, the NPC would ultimately become the most influential organization in the North. This man was Alahaji Sahamadu Bilu, the Sadauna of Sokoto. In 1950, Sir John Macpherson, the colonial governor after Richards, made revisions to the Richards Constitution. His constitution, known as the Macpherson Constitution, expanded the regional assemblies and made provisions for the first general elections to the country. As the general election approached, the NCNC, the Action Group, and the NPC became full fledged political parties in their various regions. In 1951, a controversy ensued between the leaders of the three regions on the issue of centralizing the government. This led to the Lilington Constitution of 1954, which managed to forge a middle path between the desires of the three regions. The constitution set up the federal system of government under which Nigeria gained independence in 1960. In 1957, Sir Halaji Tafawa Balewa of the NPC became Nigeria's Prime Minister. The final election that would determine the country's first independent government was conducted in 1959. The NPC got the largest number of seats and the majority government was created through an NPC-NCNC coalition, making the Action Group the major opposition party. Alaji Tafawa Balewa maintained his position as Prime Minister and Unam Diazikiwe of the NCNC took a largely ceremonial title as Nigeria's first indigenous governor-general. On October 1, 1960, Nigeria became a full-fledged sovereign state, however, 
The foundations upon which it gained independence were not firm. The NPC and CNC coalition that governed at the federal level quickly became dominated by the NPC, which, under the leadership of the federal prime minister and the Northern Premier, undertook measures to improve the conditions of Northerners within the federation. They felt that the Northern region should have a chance to catch up with the South after suffering deliberate underdevelopment during the colonial era. They regularly handed out appointments and promotions to underqualified Northerners at the expense of more qualified Southerners. Nearly all funds they marked for defense, health, education, and roads went to projects in the North. This infuriated the Southerners, especially the NCNC, who saw their skills disregarded by a federal system that increasingly seemed to value ethnicity over merit. In 1962, the Action Group of the Western Region faced a crisis over its position as the opposition party. Some members believed that the party was becoming irrelevant at the national level and wanted to abandon their position as opposition party by becoming allies with the NPC. Among the adherents of this line of thought was Chief S.L. Akintola, who had succeeded Chief Awolowo as Premier of the Western Region in 1959. Awolowo did not like this. He tried to have Akintola removed as Premier, replacing him with his ally, Chief Adegbenro. The result was a major parliamentary crisis between Awolowo and Akintola. At this point, Prime Minister Balewa, who hoped to align with Akintola and gain a foothold in the Western region, declared a state of emergency in the West and suspended the Ashan Group government for six months, replacing it with an interim government. Akintola was reinstated as Premier by the end of the six months, but the damage done on Awolowo's Ashan Group party will prove to be an irreversible one. In 1963, a new region was carved out of the West, further weakening the Ashan Group. Things will only go from bad to worse for the party because in the same year, Awolowo and several other leaders of the Ashan group were imprisoned on charges of treason and corruption. The 1962 census presented an opportunity for the Southern parties to enroll the NPC's control of the National Assembly. The number of seats allocated to each region in the Federal Assembly was based on the regional population and from 1953, Northerners having the highest population constituted the majority. The Southern government realized that manipulating the figures would give them more seats in the Federal Assembly. When the figures were released, the Eastern and the Western region recorded an incredible 70% increase in population compared to a 30% increase in the North. Balewa refused to accept the results and the following year, another census was conducted and this time, it was the turn of the NPC to manipulate the results. 8 million new Northerners were miraculously discovered in one year. The NCNC bitterly opposed this result but failed to prevent it from becoming official. The new population of the country officially stood at about 55 million, of whom 29 million resided in the North. Having lost the fight to gain control of the Federal Assembly, the political parties in the South now turned their energies towards winning the upcoming elections of 1964. The NCNC and the Action Group united with minority parties in the North to form the United Progressive Grand Alliance UPGA. Intending to maintain the status quo, the NPC also merged with Akintola's newly formed Nigerian National Democratic Party and a few fringe parties in the South to form the Nigerian National Alliance NNA. The campaigns leading up to the 1964 elections were abominable. In the North, the NNA arrested many UPG officials and prevented their supporters from campaigning. In the Western region, clashes between NNA and UPGA supporters often resulted in violence, claiming lives and properties in the process. The goal of the NNA was to prevent UPGA candidates from being nominated and stand for elections. In this way, they hoped to present many of their candidates as unopposed. Since the NNA officials controlled the election machineries in both the North and the West, they could easily hamper the nomination process for the UPGA candidates. Outraged by the intimidation they faced, UPGA officials called for a boycott of the election, but the boycott was a success only in the Eastern region. As a result, many seats in the Northern and the Western regions went unopposed to the NNA. After the election, Balewa called Azikiwe to create an NNA-led government, but Azikiwe refused. 
He later allowed it when Balewa agreed to incorporate more UPGA members in his government, rescheduled the elections for the boycotted seats, and recontest the elections for the Western Regional Assembly the following year. The UPGA won most of the boycotted seats in the 1965 elections, but this was not enough to threaten the majority claim of the NNA. In the end, the NNA won 198 of the 312 seats in the National Assembly. Although this was a clear victory, the conduct of the election had been disastrous, causing resentment amongst the UPGA supporters and causing many Nigerians to question the fairness of the country's democratic system. Nigerians' faith in their system of government, already weakened by the 1964 elections, was further strained by the Western Regional Elections of October 1965. The election was a disaster. When the preliminary results were announced on October the 13th, Akintola and the NNDP claimed 51 seats to the UPGA's 11, with 30 seats still to be decided. Chief Adegbenro, the acting leader of the Action Group, immediately declared 68 victories for the UPGA and announced that he was forming an interim government. For this, Adegbenro and other leaders of the Action Group were arrested. Throughout November and December, UPGA supporters took to the streets to protest the election results. The riots were widespread, often resulting in clashes with the police. The Western region had turned into the Wild West. Rather than call a state of emergency in the Western region, Balewa decided to send the army to the West, but it still wasn't enough to stop the crisis. The Western region was out of control. Disgusted by the political mess the country was in after only six years of independence, a group of politically radical army officers took the bait. They decided that the only means out of the political deadlock was to execute a military revolution to overthrow the government. At the core was a group of young army officers in the rank of major. They planned to overthrow the government, release Shifo Bafemi Awolowo from prison, and install him as president. In the early hours of January the 15th, 1966, they struck. Before Nigerian's independence, the colonial government embarked upon transferring the command of the Nigerian army from the British to the indigenous soldiers. This program, known as the Nigerianization exercise, saw the influence of many Nigerians into the military. In the end, the Nigerianization exercise unintentionally stratified the army on ethnic lines. At independence, the Igbos from the eastern region of southern Nigeria constituted 60% of the army's official corps while lower positions like the infantry soldiers and NCOs were largely occupied by the Northerners. One of the reasons for this was that the vast majority of Northerners were uneducated. As a result, they couldn't compete with the largely educated Southerners who quickly took up most of the highest positions in the army. Although the educational requirements were largely reduced to accommodate more Northern soldiers, the ethnic hierarchical structure of the army remained largely unchanged. In 1965, Major General Johnson Agwe Ironsi, a southerner from the eastern region, commanded the entire Nigerian army. At the time, the army had only two brigades and five battalions. The first and the largest brigade, located in the north, controlled the third and the fifth battalions. It was commanded by Brigadier Samuel Ademulegun, a southerner from the western region. The second brigade, commanded by a formidable northern soldier, Brigadier Zekaria Mayamulari, was located in Lagos, the country's capital. It controlled the 1st, 2nd and the 4th battalions in the south. During the crisis of the western region that saw the imprisonment of Shifo Bafemi Awolowo, the leader of the major opposition party, and the creation of an alliance between the federal government and its rival, Chief Essel and Kintola, some southern soldiers became deeply involved in politics. To make matters worse, the federal government ordered the 4th Battalion, led by Lieutenant Colonel Agbogo Lajema, to suppress the volatile political unrest in the West. As a result, the officers, especially those from the South, became politicized. Southern officers were more likely to be politicized than their Northern counterpart because the government which they saw as corrupt was largely controlled by the Northerners. They saw the trial and the imprisonment of Shifo Bafemi Awolowo in particular as unjust. One of the southern soldiers who served as an intelligence officer during the trial was Major Chukuma Kaduna Uzegu. He quickly became obsessed with Abolobo's political ideology. 
This would lead him and some other officers to plan a revolution that would change the country forever. They plan to overthrow the government, release Chief Obafemi Awolowo from prison and install him as president. Chief Obafemi Awolowo was for example to be released from jail immediately and to be made the executive provisional president of Nigeria. Contrary to popular beliefs, the idea for the coup did not originate with Major Unziegu. In fact, the original conspirators were the following majors. Emmanuel Ifejuna, Donatus Okafo, Christian Hanoforo, Humphrey Shukuka, and Captain Ugbona Hoji. These men were based in Lagos and began to see co-conspirators stationed in the north, east, and western regions. This led Major Anuforo to bring his childhood friend and former schoolmate Major Kaduna Nzegu into the plot. Nzegu was a chief instructor at the Nigerian Military Training College Kaduna in the northern region. He in turn brought his colleagues Majors Adewale Ademoyega and Timothy Owantwegu into the plot. All three had previously served as members of the 5th Battalion in Kano. Serving the arrest in the western region was one of the reasons for the revolution. But up to two days before the planned date, the Majors had no officer to actualize the operations in Ibadan, the capital of the western region. All attempts to recruit officers from the 4th Battalion in Ibadan were unsuccessful. They instead had to rely on Captain Wobosi, the commanding officer of the 2nd Fleet Battery in Abiyakuta, to travel to Ibadan and carry out the coup. He was also a former schoolmate of Majors Unzegu and Anoforo. Of all the culprits, Major Ademoyega was the only one that was not of the Igbo ethnicity. He was a Yoruba from the western region. Although the ethnic composition of the group may not have been deliberate, ethnic ties may have been unconsciously present to facilitate the plot's secrecy. The plotters had similar backgrounds. They were young, between the ages of 28 and 35, educated, arrogant, well-traveled, and fluent in Aousa, the major Leguan Franca of the northern region. Realizing that their superior officers were virtually certain to oppose the coup, the majors knew that they could not successfully execute the revolution unless those superior officers could somehow be neutralized. The plotters were divided into four main units. Major Ifejuna led the Lagos operations. His unit was the largest, comprising 22 soldiers. Their main targets were the Prime Minister, the Finance Minister, the General Officer commanding the Army, the Commanding Officer of the 2nd Brigade in Lagos, the Army Chief of Staff, the Commanding Officer of the 1st and the 4th Battalions who were in Lagos for a visit at the time, the Adjutant General of the Nigerian Army and the Quartermaster General of the Nigerian Army. At the time, the President was overseas on a compulsory medical leave. He was also on the list. Majors Nzegu and Owatwegu led the operations in the northern region. Their main targets were the Premier of the northern region, the Commanding Officer of the 1st Brigade and the Commanding Officer of the Nigerian Military Training College in Kaduna. Captain Wobosi was in charge of the operations in the west. Their major targets were the Premier of the western region and his deputy. The western region was the only region that had a deputy premier. Lieutenant Colonel Jerome Oguchi led the operation on the eastern region. The Premier of the Eastern Region were their main targets. On the issue of eliminating the targets, the Majors held divergent beliefs. We could not come into agreement on whether some people should be killed. This issue was therefore left to the judgment of the officers to use the situation on ground to determine whether to kill or not. For an operation as sensitive as this, the decision to take or spare the lives of their targets was left to the discretion of the individual soldiers. This decision will later prove to be unwise. In the north, the soldiers divided themselves into three groups. Major Unzegu headed the group that looked after the South Downer. Another group led by Captain Ben Boulay was to take control of the 1st Brigade headquarters and all radio and TV stations in Kaduna. Major Timothy Iwantuegu was to lead the detachment of soldiers to the residence of Brigadier Ademolegu, the commanding officer of the 1st Brigade in Kaduna, and Colonel Raf Shodiende, the commanding officer at the Nigerian Military Training College, who was also his immediate boss. Major Unzegu, assisted by three Northern sergeants, fired the Saudana's residence with the tank guns. Unzegu found the Saudana hiding with his wives and domestic staffs near his car park and shot him dead. Meanwhile, soldiers led by Major Wontuwegu made their way to Ademolegu's residence. 
subdued his guards and went straight to the brigadier's bedroom. He was lying beside his wife. Umot Wego opened the door and shot both of them dead. The death of Colonel Ralph Shodiende, the commanding officer at the Nigerian Military Training College, remains unclear. The responsibility for the colonel's death certainly lies with Major Umot Wego. So far, the northern region seemed to have been entirely subdued. The mutinants now awaited the reports from their southern counterparts. In Lagos, on the night of the 14th of January 1966, many senior officers of the army attended the party in honor of Brigadier Mai Malari, the commanding officer of the 2nd Brigade. Also in attendance were some of the cool plotters in Lagos who felt that their absence will elicit suspicion. After the party, the plotters held a meeting at Major Ife Ojuna's house. The Major acquainted the officers with their plans and after which they were on the move, everyone on their separate mission. Getting to the Onikon roundabout, Major Ife Juna divided his troops into three units. The first, led by 2nd Lieutenant Godfrey Ezedibo, was charged with arresting the Finance Minister Chief Festoff Okote Ebo, who was then the most corrupt politician in the history of the country. The second unit, comprising five NCOs, was left behind to wash over the vehicles and ensure that no other vehicle entered or exited the roundabout during the operation. Major Infe Ejuna led the third unit to the Prime Minister's residence. Between 2 and 3 am on the 15th of January 1966, Major Infe Ejuna and some soldiers made their way to the Prime Minister's residence. The intruders overpowered the police officers on guard and forced the ADCs at gunpoint to lead them to the Prime Minister's living quarters. When the Prime Minister opened the bedroom door, he found Major Infe Ejuna brandishing a gun at him. Ife Juna saluted and informed him that he was under arrest. Allowed to say his prayers, Balewa was led out of the building wearing a white gown, white trousers and slippers. By the time they reached the parked vehicles, Chief Okote Ebo, the finance minister, had been arrested with his hands tied. The officers assisted Balewa into the back seat of Ife Juna's car and threw Okote Ebo in the back of a three-toner truck. The convoy drove to the Federal Guard's official mess, which was the rendezvous location for the Lagos plotters. Elsewhere, soldiers led by Major Ademoyega set up roadblocks and occupied strategic locations, including the control room of the police headquarters at the Lion Building and the Nigerian External Communication Building in Lagos. A group of soldiers, led by Major Don Okafo and Captain Oji, arrived at the home of Brigadier Mamilari the commander of the 2nd Brigade. Okafo tried to bluff his way past Mayam Larry's guards by claiming that he had come to take over guards' duties from them, but the guards were not buying it. About the same time, another attack was taking place at the residence of the Adjutant General, Lieutenant Colonel James Palm. Major Humphrey Shukuka, his colleague at the Army headquarters, led the attack. Pam placed a call to Mayam Larry to report some shootings in his compound but as soon as the brigadier picked up the receiver, he heard a burst of machine gun fire emanating from his residence. It was the sound of Okafo's men engaging his guards in a gunfight. He immediately dropped the receiver and ran out of the house into the road. Major Okafo's attempt to track him down were unsuccessful. Elsewhere, Colonel Kaur Mohamed, the Army Chief of Staff, and Lieutenant Colonel Hunigbe, the Quartermaster General of the Nigerian Army, were shot dead in their homes by Major Anoforo. Hunigbe was the only Igbo killed during the coup. He was shot in the presence of his pregnant wife. What is more probable is that Hunigbe was killed because he was known to be very close to Brigadier Mai Malari and was not interested in the coup. Meanwhile, Major General Agwe Ironsi, the general officer commanding the Nigerian army, was leading a sham life. After leaving Brigadier Mamilari's party, he left for another party at the Apapa Wharf. While he was attending the party, soldiers led by Major Don Okafor showed up at his house. Ironsi's guards became suspicious when Okafor explained that they had come to take over guard duties from them. The same pretext he used when he was trying to assess Brigadier Mai Malari's residence. And by the way, Okafo had now received the news that Brigadier Mai Malari had been killed. In any case, Agwe Ronsi was nowhere to be found and the plotters left the premises empty-handed. 
Overnight, Major Ife Juna sent orders to the 1st Battalion in Enugu, asking them to deploy soldiers to take over key installations and arrest some top government officials in both the eastern and the midwestern region. For several hours, the officers in Enugu mulled over the strange but seemingly legitimate order. Soldiers under Captain Joseph Ehidibo headed to Benin, the capital of the Midwest, and placed Chief Dennis Osadibe, the region's premier, under house arrest. Dr. Michael Opara, the premier of the eastern region, was also arrested. Soldiers led by Lieutenant Uguchi ordered his arrest. When Nagui Ronsi returned from the second party, he received a telephone call from the Prime Minister's residence that the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance had been kidnapped. He runs headed for the Federal Guards Barrack and instructed his guards not to let anyone in. When he arrived, he put the Federal Guards soldiers on alert and told them to be battle ready and instructed the Regimental Sergeant Major in charge not to take orders from any officer other than him. When Major Okafor reappeared at the Federal Guards Barrack, he discovered that his men refused to take orders from him. I just spoke to my ROSM just now. He nearly shot me. He said the GOC had been to the barracks and he commanded the troops not to take any orders from me and none of them will obey me now. They were even ready to shoot me. Ironsi also went to the police headquarters in Lagos. Unbeknown to him, Major Ademo Iga had been at the headquarters and departed only minutes earlier. Ironsi entered the lobby with his pistol and saw two soldiers posted there by Major Ademo Iga. When the soldiers could not give him a satisfactory explanation as to what they were doing there, he ordered them to return to their barracks immediately. The GOC then proceeded to rouse soldiers from the 2nd Battalion. Arriving at the 2nd Battalion headquarters, the GOC gave orders for the arrest of Major Ife Juna and other of his co-conspirators. Armed with orders from the GOC, soldiers from the 2nd Battalion mobilized loyal troops to recapture certain key installations in Lagos. Realizing that the GOC was still in town and still alive and mobilizing troops for a counter-attack, some of the plotters in Lagos began to flee. The ones brave enough to return found out that the troops they had posted to strategic locations had either been dismissed, arrested, or replaced with soldiers loyal to Ironsi. The GOC then ordered Lieutenant Colonel Ejo, the commanding officer of the 1st Battalion, to return to Enugu and take charge of the situations there. Upon arrival, Ejo ordered the soldiers who had departed to various installations on Major Infe Junior's command to return to the barracks. He also ordered the arrest of the officer who relayed Ife Juna's orders to the battalion. Later that day, Captain Yehidibo's unit that travelled to Benin returned to base in Enugu on the orders of Hedra. And with that, Ejo had successfully crushed the coup in the eastern and the midwestern region. Though Major Unzegu was in control of Kaduna and most of the north, he wasn't in control of the entire north. Lieutenant Colonel Ojuku, the commanding officer of the 5th Battalion in Kanu, refused to cooperate with the Major. On the morning of the coup, Ojuku had received a telegram informing him that the coup was in place. Seeing this, he quickly locked the armory and sent his keys to a relative in Kanu for safekeeping before he dared to share the news with his men. When Nzegu asked him to release funds for his soldiers to be paid, he refused. Nzegu then sent Captain Ude, one of his aides, to Kano, but when he arrived, Ojuku arrested him. Meanwhile, Major Sademo Ega and Anuforo were still on the loose, seeking ways to get past the loyal troops guarding the key areas around Lagos. For fear of getting caught or losing their lives, Ademo Ega and Anuforo went into hiding. Elsewhere, it was now becoming clear to Major Infer Juna and his men that the coup in Lagos had failed. And since the GOC was still alive, mobilizing troops on every side, the Major felt no point keeping the Prime Minister alive. The convoy came to a halt, close to a bush on the Lagos Abiyakuta Road. Sir Abubakar Tafawa Baliwa, Nigeria's first Prime Minister, was told to step out of the car into the bush. Major Infer Juna, brought out his gun and shot him. The Prime Minister fell on the foot of a tree close by, dead. After crushing the coup in most parts of the country, except in the north, Ironsi was advised by his officers to take power. They argued that this was the only way they could stabilize the country and prevent further bloodshed. The next day, Ironsi held a meeting with the Council of Ministers, after which 
they agreed to surrender power to the armed forces. The Council of Ministers meeting on the 16th of January 1966 have asked us to convey to you their unanimous decision to transfer voluntarily the government to the armed forces of the Republic and to wish the success of the armed forces in bringing about peace and stability in Nigeria and that the welfare of the people shall be their paramount tax. My main concern is to restore law and order as soon as possible. On Sunday evening, most of the plotters in the south were still on the loose and Major Unzegu was still in control of the northern region. Agu Ironsi had managed to subdue his colleagues in the south, leaving him with two choices, either to face Ironsi head on, which he was likely to lose as the bulk of the army would obey the GOC's orders rather than his, or accept defeat. Ironsi had demanded he be brought down to Lagos, dead or alive. Before long, Major Unzi Agu found himself isolated, confused and feeling betrayed, and he decided to negotiate with the GOC. Now, what are your relations with General Iranti in Lagos? Well, very good. He's my boss. I uh, have always been under him, and uh, I still have. I still am under him. There isn't really any problem with you. Uh, misunderstandings arose, but uh, this, this was due to the publication in the press and by announcements over the radio. At one time, they started calling us in Kaduna rebels. Whereas, in fact, the revolution was all. It's land of uh, all over the country. On January the 17th, 1966, after a few days of negotiations, Major Unzegu appeared before the joint press and handed over the control of the northern region to the new military government. On the 19th of January 1966, Major Shukuma Kaduna Unzegu was arrested. Subsequently, most of his conspirators were also arrested. Major Sademo Yega and Owon Tuegu returned to their place of work as if nothing had happened. They managed to stay free for a few weeks until their role in the coup was revealed. Thereupon, they were arrested. Major Ife Juna fled to Ghana and was received by President Kwame Nkrumah. He later unwisely returned to Nigeria. Upon arrival, he was swiftly arrested. And with the arrest of Major Unzegu and his co-conspirators, the coup had been successfully crushed. Nigerians welcomed the new military government with massive outpouring of jubilations and goodwill. Newspapers around the country opened with headlines celebrating the overthrow of the government. As well as becoming the head of state, Agwe Ronsi was elevated from the army's GOC to supreme commander of the Nigerian armed forces and was now in overall command of the army, air force, navy and the police. After coming to power in January 1966, he immediately appointed military governors in each of the country's four regions. The new military government abolished the post of Prime Minister and President and formed a new Supreme Military Council. The council replaced the parliament as Nigeria's highest legislative organ. Also, a new cabinet known as the Federal Executive Council replaced the Council of Ministers in the previous regime. The new regime declared itself a corrective government and began to detain politicians from the previous government, except those from the north. In May 1966, Agui issued what might be considered as one of the most controversial decrees in the country's history, the Unification Decree. The decree unified the previously separate civil service of each region. Previously, the civil service had been regionalized with each region having control of its civil services. Northerners did not like this. They feared that unifying the civil service would expose them to competition from the better educated southerners, especially the Igbos, who could easily replace them. Northern reaction to the decree was swift and violent. In the same month, Northern mobs took to the streets and protested. Many Igbos living in the north were attacked and murdered. And suddenly, Northerners began to see the coup as an Igbo plot to dominate the entire country. Soon, this ideology would spread to the northern soldiers who had lost some of their brothers and friends to the coup. They now felt the need to avenge the death of their northern colleagues more than in January. Agwe Ironsi's inclusion of some of these northern soldiers in his private security team 
would ultimately seal his fate. On the 28th of July 1966, barely six months into the new regime, a northern soldier by the name of Lieutenant Colonel Mutala Mohamed would mastermind one of the bloodiest coups in Africa's history to remove Major General Agwe Ronsi from power. This coup will be famously known as the July Remarch. Ladies and gentlemen, why do I keep bringing these things? I keep bringing them because the truth shall set you free. We can't sit down and let the narrative of our country be distorted by people who have no good intentions for our country. There are bigots who are comfortable in where they are sitting. This video is not for them. And my fight for bringing the right to Nigerians does not include bringing the rights to them. They are bigots. They are going to sit where they want to sit. And I don't give a rat's ass about them. My mission is to bring the truth to progressive Nigerians, East, West, North, and South, Fulani, Hausa, Yoruba, Ibo, Edo, Ibibio, Ijo, Efik, Igbera, wherever they are. Those are the only ones who can fix our country. However, if the progressive Nigerians decide not to fight to fix Nigeria and let the bigots call the shots and determine what happens, well, we can kiss Nigeria goodbye. And my efforts in that case is to find a way to have us find amic amicable ways to go our separate ways. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, this is Fred Mwanko coming to you from our studios in Chicago with another edition of Bull Talk on Allen TV. And until next time, good night and God bless. When your master love you, I found one was a rubio. Max, if you have one, 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 when your master of the code, I want my water and the sign. If you want your name, I'm going to move. Like I don't need music. Oh, like I don't need